welcome everybody. The you know this this is a both a timely and uh, some people will consider an untimely uh, topic to talk about because unfortunately now in our society there's uh, very few people who uh, haven't been touched uh, by somebody who uh, either personally is experiencing cancer or a loved one or a family member. You know we we have the aspect that you know the last two years have sort of been taken over by COVID. Uh, with but and sort of we've almost forgotten that still uh, what's very present in our society and the numbers as we'll see are still pretty staggering as far as cancer is concerned. Next slide. <clears throat> so what we what we're what I hope to leave you with uh, in the next hour is that you'll have an understanding of cancer from you know the conventional approach to cancer. Uh, the approach that I prefer to think about is from a more biological medicine approach, and then try and introduce you to some of the ways that uh, from a biological medicine perspective, we will ultimately support people who have a diagnosis of cancer. So just a few statistics that uh, can be somewhat staggering. So we have about uh, 37 trillion cells in our body and uh, of those, we, we, the body makes about 240 billion new ones. And if it's assumed that a, you know, a very tiny percent of those, all those new cells are cancer cells, uh, we all are basically making, it's projected about a million cancer cells every day, which most people say, wow, a million cancer cells. That's why we have an immune system. So for all intents and purposes, we all have cancer. We have cancer every day. Everybody on the call, everybody in society is producing a cancer cell as we're sitting here. Uh, in the US in 2021, there was 1.9 million US uh, cases diagnosed, which were probably under, under uh, reported because of COVID, because there was so much a, uh, focus on COVID last year that, uh, but even with that, the statistic is still pretty uh, you know, overwhelming. And in uh, 2021, we had over 600,000 people die of cancer. Uh, you know, a few more died supposedly of COVID, but if we really look at the reality of it, many of those people who died of COVID had cancer uh, also. So depending how you put the statistics. So basically what is suggesting that about 1600 people a day die of cancer in 2021. And each year as we move forward, as we'll see, the number was just gonna keep increasing. So these are just these are the statistics from from last year. You see that the the most common cancers, uh, twenty uh, breast making over half of the uh, of the cancers, breast and prostate uh, by far the you know the new cancer cases. And then when you look at deaths, it's still lung cancer uh, leads the way with colon and pancreas, and then breast as you see is the fourth. And even though it's the most commonly diagnosed, it's, it's interesting how we think about it because you know, people don't go around uh, having chest x-rays uh, of, their, of, their, of their lungs. People don't end up having colonoscopies. And that's why these cancers are often uh, fatal, more fatal uh, because of the fact that the diagnosis uh, of the disease happens much later on than what happens in breast cancer. As, as women are more often more aware that if they're doing a self-exam or they see their, uh, their GYN doc uh, on an annual, they're getting some form of, a, you know, of an examination. But statistics are, are definitely, they haven't really changed, to be honest with you, in many, many years. Uh, statistics, as you'll see in a sec, are a little misleading. Next. So the, the first thing is we should say is, uh, what is cancer? Uh, you know, it's, and from a biological medicine perspective, I don't really consider it, it, it is a dis-ease because that's what everybody talks about. That's what the med medical profession talks about it. But in reality, what is it? It's a reaction and it's a response really to life. It's a response to what we do uh, to ourselves, what we have done to the planet, what we have done to mother nature. And for all intents and purposes, it's a, it's a result of a sluggish defense uh, immune system. And that there's a multiple components of that. And everybody sort of thinks of the immune system as being, do I have an immune system strong enough to, you know, to, uh, prevent me from getting COVID or the flu 
or some other condition, but as we'll see, the, the, our defense system is much beyond that uh, and involves all aspects of our body. And so the result of numerous factors, uh, especially lifestyle, as we'll see, are become the critical uh, underlying component of will you actually be diagnosed with cancer or may you get cancer at a point where it's late in the diagnosis and it may uh, you know, end up being fatal in an in individual's case. But the bottom line is, as we'll see, cancer isn't something that just appears. And so the, it's a lifestyle approach that uh, you know, we, as we'll see, that uh, we need to be thinking about. So we look at important components of, of what are people eating uh, people don't, I think, pay enough attention to oral health and don't realize the importance of how uh, what's going on in our mouth and what's going on with our oral cavity has such a large impact uh, on the potential that somebody may have cancer. And I'm not just talking oral cancer of the tongue or of the throat, et cetera. Trauma plays an incredibly huge role in cancer that many people don't pay attention to. How we manage stress is a, a very large role. And, people often don't pay attention to that. And then the one that people least pay attention to is our emotions. However, these are all things over which we have 100% control. And therefore, cancer isn't a condition of, let's just cross our fingers and hope we never get diagnosed. But what is it are we doing on an everyday basis that potentially has the potential of, of uh, mitigating these a million cancer cells that are being formed uh, every day? So it's only a word and it's not a sentence. Um, you know, I've used this uh, discussion with people. Unfortunately, uh, cancer in our society is felt to be, it's sort of the death sentence. It's like, it's, a, it's the word that people never wanna hear uh, related to their own body. But the reality is there's, there's a, a lot of, I'll say misnomer about the, the whole concept of what cancer is. So. Remember, it is not a sentence. It doesn't mean that uh, you, will, you will ultimately pass away from this illness. There's no one in society who is immune uh, to cancer. Um, I've seen children as young as three and four months old with cancer. Uh, the, and you know, the most typical age that people develop cancer is uh, over 50. And there's a reason for that. Uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, you have to be 50. And as I said, we, we see young children and we know that uh, St. Jude's uh, work that basically work with children. I mean, their entire hospital is full of uh, young, young people uh, who have cancer. The American Cancer Society in 2020 reported that uh, in your lifetime, men have a one in two likelihood of being diagnosed with cancer and women have a one in three likelihood of being diagnosed with cancer. And by 2050, which is less than 30 years from now, those numbers will increase by another 50%. So even though the amount of money that's being spent on research, uh, as we'll talk about, really has nothing to do with preventing cancer, the research is really only about if you get it, how do you try and treat it to try and uh, prolong uh, qu quantity of life versus quality of life. So what is it? Uh, you know, if we look at the straight physiology, it's basically a normal cell uh, that our body has. And we have, as I said, 37 trillion of them in our body. So it's this normal cell that, that transforms to a so-called tumor cell based on a mutation in our genetics. Uh, we know that uh, our genetics are what is responsible for, uh, you know, everything reproducing our cells and different cells reproduce at different times. Uh, the cells that reproduce the most quickly and turn over are actually in our eye, and they can be as quick as every 30 hours or so. Our digestive system cells turn over in as quickly as every three to five days. Our nervous system takes much longer. Uh, our bone turns over, you know, so it, every cell has its sort of a different life cycle. And so a cell grows, does its function, gets worn out, and then the, the immune system naturally removes it in, in a process that we call apoptosis. So these genetic mutations can then be inherited uh, from, you know, from your parents. And that's how a three month old baby can have cancer because it's actually been inherited probably from a grandparent or great grandparent and it's been passed down uh, through, the, through, through genetics. 
And it begins with what we call oxidative stress uh, on our DNA. The DNA is what is what is in our genes. So these you know, free radicals are made inside our body uh, by the combustion of oxygen, which we're breathing in. And the air you're breathing right now is about 21% oxygen. Uh, and the, these free radicals help to, to break down and to uh, make less toxic uh, chemicals. And uh, they're very potent antimicrobials, antimicrobials being viruses, bacteria, and fungus that we're constantly exposed to. The area you're breathing right now is actually full of them because they're everywhere. Uh, and we take antioxidants, uh, mostly from our food, uh, which is why diet plays such an important role in cancer. It's also why we say the more colors that you eat, the more exposure that you'll have to a variety of antioxidants. And, the, and these antioxidants will control oxygen reactions. So we have the standard vitamins, vitamin C and vitamin E and selenium, lipoic, beta carotene, that are, are examples that are uh, in our in colored foods, mostly fruits and vegetables, uh, and are potent examples of these antioxidants. And then when we get exposed to things like radiation or chemicals, and there's you know tens of thousands of chemicals that uh, we get exposed to on an everyday basis, but then we have our own stress hormones, and uh, and every other carcinogen, a, a product that basically causes these uh, DNA changes. It produces this oxidation in our DNA, which results in the so-called mutant gene. But it takes a number of these uh, you know, reproductions within our uh, specific mutations, changes in the cell so that the cell doesn't wipe itself out. It doesn't basically create apoptosis, which is why we call cancer cells sort of immortal. They, they don't die. They just keep reproducing and reproducing and reproducing and reproducing. And so these malignant cells, unfortunately, don't die. Uh, even when they're highly mutated, damaged, and very old, our, our so-called healthy cells will you know, re replace themselves. But cancer cells, unfortunately, have been able to uh, avoid uh, the, our safety factors of, of what's going on. So cancer develops, as I said, from the single mutation in a single cell. Uh, and they are by nature uh, immortal, so meaning they're monoclonal, uh, meaning it's one cell and it just keeps reducing, uh, reproducing. Now, what most people don't realize is that cancer isn't a process that just happened. Uh, people who've had cancer will often ask their oncologists and say, oh, when did this start? And they may say, oh, probably started six months ago uh, or three years ago. The reality is, no, it actually started 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, because cancer is a, is a very long-term process. It takes years and years and years uh, for ultimately to develop. And that's why, you know, we, uh, the American Cancer Society suggests mammography, for example, started at age 40, uh, colonoscopies, it used to be 50, but now that they're finding uh, younger people with colon cancer, they've actually moved it to age 45. And they said, why wait to age 45 unless you have a, a rel an immediate relative who died at 35 of breast cancer or colon cancer, they'll often recommend that that individual be tested earlier. But the reality is, is that it takes that many years before you actually are able to see something, to feel something, to image something, even though the process has been going on for all these years and years and years. And it's also why they suggest that, uh, at least biological medicine suggests, if you've had two colonoscopies that have been clean, uh, the likelihood, and you're 50 or 60 years old, the likelihood of you dying from colon cancer is virtually none because it would take another 20 or 30 years before you would even be able to see something uh, in general. So, you know, we look at this so-called intervention stage very late in the game. So when we really need to be looking at treating, uh, preventing cancer is literally preconception. Uh, looking at, you know, the genetics of our of our parents or our grandparents, et cetera. So we have these three stages. Uh, the initiation phase, which is the primary genetic mutation that has come from whatever, you name it, whether it's a chemical, whether it's a poor diet, uh, whether it's a medication that somebody's taken, uh, you know, whatever. And so over a period of time, there's this, this stage called promotion where these carcinogenic events, which is usually repeated, 
uh, that com complete this, the neoplastic transformation of the initiated mutant cell into ultimately grow big enough to be a, a tumor. And then in time, as it continues to grow and develop, it then starts to spread metastatically. <clears throat> Next. So what we see is we see a timeline. So as I said, we have a 20 to 30 year process uh, of cells growing and growing and growing and growing. And not until that they meet a certain, certain threshold as far as the number of cells that are involved, uh, do you end up with a diagnosis of cancer. Now, energetically, of course, which is what Biomed uh, really has focuses on, is not waiting until you can actually see it on, a, on an MRI or a CT scan or a blood test or uh, feel it physically, uh, et cetera. It's just like, we can assume that it's happening. You can assume right now that there's a cancer cell or many cancer cells in your body that haven't yet reached a, a level of being enough of diagnosis. And as these, and depending where the intervention comes along the process, you eventually may reach a threshold where it's become so-called irreversible. Irreversible from the aspect that it's so overwhelming to multiple tissues that we don't have the means, the body doesn't have the means to return it to normal physiology. But biological medicine is much more focused on uh, treating it or supporting it, we'll say, before we actually get to that necessary diagnosis. Although that doesn't mean that once we have a diagnosis that we certainly can't uh, provide effective therapies. So these are the uh, American Cancer Society uh, you know, recommendations or suggestions as to the components that are involved in, you know, wh why do people get cancer? So we've talked about the genetic, it's a genetic disease, if you like, that results from these mutations that are happening on an everyday basis. Uh, we know that uh, the heredity, our hormones, and our, what our immune system is doing plays a huge role. Uh, and they all play different roles in their factor on some level, there most many of them are multiple, all happening at one time. And so, environmental causes are these: the chemicals that we get exposed to on an everyday basis, uh, radiation. Uh, you know, it's and radiation is sort of a necessary evil in our society. You know, when when one of the interesting things about when a cancer, when a patient has cancer and it's being treated, uh, often the oncologist will say, "Well, we need to do another CT scan." Uh, you know, and some oncologists are saying, no, don't do them too often because the more times you get exposed, the more likelihood that you'll actually create more mutant cells. Uh, infections are, have been, are associated with some nature of some cancers. Uh, historically, uh, smoking uh, and lung cancer was, you know, the number one uh, uh, reversible uh, lifestyle component. That actually has been replaced now by diet because um, diet and obesity have, are the, actually the number one reversible aspects that relate to uh, some cancers. We know that there's a sexual history as far as some type of cervical cancers and some, you know, HPV, et cetera. And then the pace on some people, you know, you hear about coal miners, uh, you know, in the old days when there wasn't proper protection. So there are some occupations as a healthcare worker. Uh, we get exposed, the uh, hepatitis is an exposure from needle sticks and that type of thing. And so, you know, you take a combination of all these things and you start thinking, wow, is it, is it possible that we can possibly avoid this? And the, the reality is that, you know, you're going to, we live in a, in a society that has these things going on. So it's not about, well, I can't do anything. I'm not going to live on the top of Mount Everest. I am going to be exposed, but there are so many positive things that we can do for ourselves to help mitigate some of these realities that happen in our life. Next. So these are the, you know, the, the belief is, and this was published, as you see, 17 years ago in Lancet, uh, where they basically said, these are all modifiable, uh, you know, things that we can, how we can affect, uh, you know, the, the development of cancer. High body mass, low fruit and vegetable intake, physical inactivity, smoking, alcohol, unsafe sex, air pollution, uh, indoor use of solid fluids, uh, fuels and contamination infections in healthcare settings. They're all manageable. We, and there is certainly a public awareness of most of these things, but yet people don't do them, uh, you know, routinely, but they are there. And they said they've been published for, you know, the last couple of decades. And the more we talk about it, the more people don't seem to want to change about it. 
however, the people who are listening today have an interest in and say, well, we're going to do something about it. But in general, society is not there yet. So this is an interesting component that, uh, you know, people keep quoting and, uh, you know, the, the, the aspect um, of, you know, what have we made much impact uh, in cancer uh, itself uh, over time? So if we look at cancer, uh, we look at two different patients. Uh, one who, you know, was basically uh, diagnosed uh, in, 19, in 2021, excuse me, and one who was diagnosed in 1975. So if you look at breast cancer, which as we say, a five-year survival in 75 was 75%. And now in 2021, it's 99% for localized uh, breast cancer, 72% <laughs> if it's a stage three or stage four. So if, you, if that's all you looked at, you'd say, we have certainly made very positive, significant impacts on you know, decreasing deaths. Now, you also have to remember that cancer survival is considered five years. Uh, but what happens if the person died five years in one week? Uh, they would not be, they would be considered a cancer survivor, uh, generally, even if they passed away from the illness. So the statistics can be a little misleading. So if we look at the, the cancer survival in 1975, using that timeline, you basically see that uh, the diagnosis in 1975 was much later in the disease process. You know, the, the whole idea of public health, the whole idea of awareness of, uh, of cancer diagnosis so comes. So what has happened, and, and so in 2021, which is why we have a 95% uh, survival uh, for what's going on, it it's happens that, you know, with, with women being aware of getting exams, self-exams, seeing the, their gynecologist uh, having mammography or thermography, whichever is our ultrasound is ever more appropriate for them individually, we have a much longer timeline. However, the same 20 or 30 year process was going on. So for all intents and purposes, they actually die at the same time after the initiation of the mutant cell. So we've done a great job in diagnosis, but unfortunately we haven't done a great job in actually understanding and preventing it. So we, the, the present model of, of cancer looks at uh, you know, a polyp. Uh, when you do a colonoscopy and, and, the, and the, the doctor removes the polyp and says, oh, this was a precancerous lesion. <clears throat> or if you go to the dermatologist and they said you have a tinea keratosis or you have a precancerous skin cancer. So the idea is if you <clears throat> remove those, you're actually preventing cancer. But from a biological medicine perspective, that's really not what we're doing because we're still, you know, it's the proverbial, the horse uh, is already, uh, you know, 10 miles down the road and we say we should close the burn door. If you have a polyp, if you have a precancerous lesion, the cancer process has been going on for years and years already. So we need a step further back, which I think is the aspect of how biological medicine really tends to think about any type of illness, including a cancer. Uh, and so the, the idea is, is that if we do something in, in the aspect of literally trying to suppress or hide or so we can't see it, we just, <clears throat> we can wait a longer period of time before something happens with the idea of maybe we'll, we'll ultimately die of something else, be hit in a traffic accident or whatever. Cancer, and I think the, the other, uh, misnomer is that we should never think of cancer as being local. Um, you know, not some number of you people on the line may have, you know, been had a had breast cancer or a cancer <clears throat> and maybe you had a lumpectomy and because it was local and they said, okay, the, the cancer now will just follow it. However, I can assure you, if you have a cancer cell in your breast, uh, you also have it in your big toe. It's also in your liver. It's also in your pancreas because they don't stay local. It's called a lymphatic system. It moves things around. So I don't ever think of cancer as being local, uh, even though it's sort of treated as that. And so when you see it in a lymph node, when you see it in another organ, now we call it metastatic disease. Now we call it a stage three or stage four. As I said, we basically reached the point where there's many, many cells throughout the body, but if we just, if I just make the assumption, I'm going to treat the entire person, 
I'm not going to just treat a local organ. That way, we, I, I believe from a biological medicine perspective, we have a much better likelihood that we'll have the opportunity uh, to, to move forward. <clears throat> Next. <clears throat> so we look at uh, uh, trying to create an understanding of the, the terrain, we say, which looks at uh, the aspects of the numerous things that are underlying. It's the terrain that ultimately leads to a pathology, and then eventually we get a diagnosis, you know, from the conventional model uh, using, uh, you know, all the tools that we have. <clears throat> but the the aspect of that of waiting till we have a diagnosis is sort of the proverbial, you know, closing the barn door when the horse is already out the door. So we know that childhood traumas, the emotional losses, uh, have a huge impact potentially on people who may develop cancer. We know that an imbalance in somebody's terrain will ultimately also determine whether or not uh, they'll develop a, a cancer it's also. Next. So these adverse childhood experiences that have now been written about and I'm about to publish a book uh, actually related specifically to this and how that has such an impact not only on cancer but almost on every disease that exists in society. So and there's, in the last two decades, there's been so much research and so much uh, indication of how these childhood experiences impact our health. And we see that uh, you know, from that particular uh, one that was published, you see 24 years ago, uh, basically shows that childhood experiences unfortunately lead to early death, not from cancer, but from other things. So cancer is the best treatment of cancer is to not get it, obviously, but we all get it. I already said that. So how do we manage these million, can these up to a million cancer cells is we, we, uh, we optimize all our organ functions. We optimize our liver, we optimize our digestive system, we optimize our mental emotional state, we optimize our immune state, et cetera, et cetera. So we get everything working properly. And when everything works properly, our, all our multiple functions, not just a immune system, but every function is actually allowed to keep this in balance. And you know, your body doesn't have any trouble getting rid of a million cancer cells on an everyday basis. As you said, there's 240 billion cells replacing every day. So a million is a drop in the bucket. So it has the, the, the resources to do it unless we're constantly being irritated uh, by what's going on next. So this, these are the cancer, the present strategies. If it's localized, we do surgery. If it's not localized, we can do surgery and radiation. If it's spread, we do add chemotherapy. And now the latest introduction in the last couple of decades is what we call biological or targeted therapies. So this is the approach. And that's, that's all the approach is. That's it, period. Next. So, but from a biological perspective, it's not the approach. So this is the approach. This is the multiple aspects is how do we help uh, minimize carcinogens? How do we address the emotional fear, which is often underlying this? How do we improve the, uh, the, the cellular activity, the extracellular matrix? How do we improve somebody's terrain? How do we remove the promoters from the environmental exposures that you have? How do we, how do we repair uh, the DNA? How do we control inflammation? How do we optimize somebody's body mass index? How do we uh, add the addition of natural therapies? How do we support a balanced immune system? How do we reduce minimum adverse effects from any medication that somebody is taking? And uh, if, if we're doing chemo or radiation as part of the treatment, how do we uh, optimize the body's ability to remove those as, as efficiently, as quickly as possible? And there, how do we prevent a recurrence, a uh, new cancer formation? Next. So one size is not fit all. So Biomed takes great pride in the fact that we individualize treatment uh, because just because you have the name of a condition, it isn't, it isn't one of those four therapies that are typically used. Next, uh, we actually individualize the treatment to what it is. So the primary goal, and there should be a picture there. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Uh, is that. Uh, so if your diet looks like that, then you're way ahead of the game. Uh, the goal is what we really want to do is a diet that, that minimizes the release of insulin from the body. What's interesting about cancer cells is they take up insulin four times faster than any other cell. And the people are familiar with insulin in regards to diabetes or hypoglycemia, but in the form of, in the term of cancer, 
uh, insulin really is uh, incredibly destructive in a cancer patient because eating a diet that, that will raise your insulin levels literally feeds cancer cells. Next. Uh, the body we need to recognize is really an electromagnet. Um, that's, and then we have these electrical charges. We see that a normal cell has this charge of about minus 70 to minus 90 millivolts. And as we age, you know, drops to minus 35 to minus 50. But unfortunately, cancer cells and ill cells have a plus 15 millivolts. And if you do surgery, radiation, chemo, or biological targeted, you actually do not address any of these, uh, the electrical charge. And I think that's one of the huge missing pieces in, in, the, in cancer modalities, which is why biological medicine focuses so much on energetic therapies, because we need to recharge the batteries. We need to get the cells at a, in a healthy uh, electrical charge. Next. Uh, and so once again, the, you know, every cell, every cell in your body has a different electrical charge. There's, di there's obviously different ways of doing that. Uh, we can do it uh, next, uh, you know, with the various therapies that we do. We call it, we add electrons into the body. One of the best ways to do that <coughs> is to ground yourself. And so if you don't know about grounding, you'll eventually hear about grounding. The best way to ground yourself is to walk bare feet on the grass or on sand, uh, to lie on the ground, to get your hands in the dirt, to garden, et cetera. And what you're doing is you're basically picking up the electrons from the earth we can uh, also get grounding sheets that we put on our bed and sleep on it for uh, you know seven or eight or nine hours at night, constantly re-adding your electrons. So these become important essential components of treating cancer. Next. We obviously will can do invasive therapies also, including IV therapies, uh, you know, high dose vitamin C or ozone, or you know, there's other types of therapies that become part of our treatment plans. Next. <clears throat> Uh, the, the, one of the most critical aspects that cancer cells don't like is oxygen. So how do we flood the body with oxygen? The best way to flood the body with oxygen is to do deep breathing. Literally, you know, normally we are, most people are breathing 16 to 20 times a minute. Uh, but the ideal would be that you actually breathe six times a minute, which is meaning a breath uh, every five or six seconds, as opposed to uh, every, uh, you know, every th two or three seconds. In addition to, to just breathing, we do therapies that actually add oxygen into the body. Next. Uh, and, you know, these are a couple of them. Hyperbaric oxygen that you may have heard of. We use something called EWAT, which is exercise with oxygen therapy. And you see it basically increases the amount of oxygen in your body by, by about 20 times. Cancer cells love insulin. They don't like oxygen uh, and they don't like electrons. Next. And, you know, another important component, you know, we hear about the lymphatic system mostly from the aspects has the cancer cells spread into the lymph system. So we need to, on an everyday basis, be supporting our lymphatic system, which is for all intents and purposes, our sewage system. And it's how our body is, is the most effective at detox. So supporting our immune system, whether we're doing dry skin brushing, whether we're moving our bodies, whether we're doing casserole packs, whether we're drinking adequate levels of water, et cetera, are an important piece of this. Next. So remember that cancer is uh, only a word and not a sentence. And so we have so many options uh, in addition to the conventional model uh, of, of managing this, but we do all these supportive therapies, add electrons, get more oxygen in, uh, increase the amount of antioxidants that you have basically to, to fight these mutant cells. And we can have, we can actually make a huge impact uh, on patients uh, who have a diagnosis or more importantly, who don't yet have a diagnosis and who will never get a diagnosis. And I think that's the last slide. Is that the last slide, Katie? Yes, it is. <laughs> so now, now we can answer whatever questions you have. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Tom. So as a reminder, um, if you do have questions, we invite you to place them in the chat box and I'll be happy to offer them um, for you. Uh, thank you, Liz. Um, we're gonna start with questions that were submitted ahead of time by uh, participants on today's call. Um, the first asks about 
uh, how a patient might reduce the risk of cancer recurring. They asked specifically in the bladder, but um, Dr. Tom, perhaps you could also speak to you know, anyone who's already had a diagnosis and is hoping to avoid recurrence or another. I'm gonna let you just take it. So the aspect of, of uh, you know, whether it's bladder or any other tissue, I mean, we can, you know, bladder, you know, if you look at what the bladder specifically does, the bladder is basically an elimination organ. And, and even urologists will say that, you know, there's everything that you basically get exposed to, whether you breathe it in, whether you eat it, uh, ultimately is removed. And so there are many type of food products and chemicals that are very irritating to the bladder. So, you know, what's the best way to, to minimize bladder cancer? is to keep flushing your bladder out on a regular basis. We know that uh, the a vast majority of, unfortunately, our population is uh, dehydrated. And so, which means there, the frequency with which urination happens, which ideally should happen maybe every three to four hours uh, throughout the day, not necessarily during the night, of course. So uh, minimizing the exposure to a variety of different foods, and we're talking, you know, where are the chemicals in foods? Mostly coming out of a box or a can, processed foods. When you're eating whole foods, like that picture that I showed, basically, it's, and hopefully it, tending to more organic than, than not organic, uh, we basically are at least minimizing the exposure to some of those chemicals. So bladder cancer, but the same is to be said for all cancers. If you eat lots of colors of foods, uh, the, the suggestion now is, is that 10 different colors is the ideal a day. And you know, the colors of the rainbow plus multiple shades of that. I think Crayola crayons have something like 2000 shades of colors now. So there's a many different shades. So <clears throat> you, know, you could eat green in four different colors, uh, whether you're eating kale or spinach or you know, other types of salads, Boston, Boston lettuce, et cetera. You get literally that, even though they're green, there are different shades, and the different shades mean there's phytonutrients, which means there's different antioxidants in general. How do you minimize the recurrence of cancer? Is doing the things that I say: get more oxygen, move your lymphatic system, move your body, uh, drink enough water to get through, get enough sleep, add electrons to your body, ground yourself. These are all the basic things of natural laws that ultimately will allow somebody to allow their multiple organ systems to return to a place of balance uh, that will allow them uh, to basically uh, minimize the, the likelihood of a recurrence. Unfortunately, the statistics have shown that somebody who's had chemotherapy, if they're not doing uh, those types of therapies, there's, there's evidence out of UCLA years ago of a research that showed that they could still find evidence of chemotherapy medications in the person's body 10 years after they stopped chemotherapy. So we obviously promote constant support, constant detox, constant drainage, if you like, to get these things out of your body because the longer they hang out there, the more likely it is that they will also be contributing to new, um, uh, you know, new cancer cells uh, ultimately forming. Thank you. And I, some of you on this call probably were, had joined us last winter when we introduced our first 21 day challenge, which is something that we uh, orchestrated in partnership with Dr. Tom. And as he references, he called them his BTGs, basic treatment guidelines. Um, you know, again, these are the things that uh, this list that he just offered as well, the things we're doing every day to um, promote well being. So, thank you for your answer to that question. The, you just mentioned chemotherapy, and, and the other question that was submitted ahead of time um, asked about uh, natural chemo. This person's heard of this and wonders if this is, is an option. <laughs> Actually, it's a misnomer because the word chemotherapy by definition is opposite of biological medicine. Chemotherapy basically means uh, a medication that basically kills things. Biological medicine is not about killing things. Biological medicine is about supporting and, uh, and returning the body to normal physiology. So, you know, the therapies that we use in biological medicine aren't theoretically treating cancer because we don't treat cancer. What they are treating is the natural uh, body organ systems that by itself will create, recreate apoptosis and that type of thing. So there are definitely, you know, there's many different types of supplements that we use, whether it's lipoic acid or curcumin or quercetin or vitamin C, as I mentioned in IVs or ozone, et cetera, that have the, the you know, if you want to call those natural substances, they are. 
and they definitely are used with great effectiveness in patients who have cancer, even if they're doing the conventional model of treatments. Uh, there's great research that shows that uh, patients who do those types of supportive treatments along with their, their, what their oncologist is suggesting actually often have much better outcomes. So uh, I guess if we're going to call it natural chemotherapy, that's the addition of those types of supportive therapies. Thank you. Uh, there was one additional question which asked whether enemas can be helpful for someone who has cancer. Uh, enemas are, uh, so a constipation or poor bowel function is uh, not a good combination to have when somebody is receiving any type of cancer treatment because, you know, the, if you think of what, what, is, what are these therapies doing, whether it's a radiation therapy or whether it's a chemotherapy, it literally is killing the cancer cell. What does that mean? It's blowing it up. And I, it was a five-year-old who one day gave me the example. I said, what do you think it's, what do you think this treatment is doing to And it's a five-year-old. He said, now those are the days of Pac-Man. So we're talking 30 years ago. He says, it's like they're eating them up and they're, they're, they're breaking them up. And so when people get adverse effects from, you know, a chemotherapy or radiation treatment, they think it's the radiation of the chemo, but the reality is what it is. It's the, it's the millions and billions of particles of cell matter that basically is congesting the lymphatic system. It blocks normal physiology and therefore the organs don't function normally or optimally. And so our goal in biological medicine is to support these natural ways that the body can get rid of these types of things. And when they do that, the person has less adverse effects. In fact, I've had many patients by the oncologist thinks because the person's hair isn't falling out or they're not quite ill, they think it mustn't be working where in fact, it's more effective. In fact, you can increase the effectiveness of the medication because the, 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 there's not so many clogged enzyme pathways or not so many clogged lymphatics. And so the people actually respond incredibly better to the treatment when doing con these concurrent therapies. Wonderful, thank you. Can you say a little bit more too I, um, about, you know, as you're talking about these million cancer cells being produced a day, I freak out. Um, but ta you know, the whole point really, again, to your, your message here is that if we're kind of taking care of ourselves in terms of lifestyle, maybe we don't need to freak out. I could use a little soothing. So million cancer cells a day, what, how, how are we naturally clearing those from our body? What is that process? The process is, uh, is, uh, simple, the, the same way that we, the reason you wash your dishes uh, after you, you know, have a meal and you, and you eat, you then eat, the next day you eat on the same dishes. The next day you eat on the same, we don't keep buying new dishes every day per se. So as the body is cleaning itself out, literally, and how do we clean itself out? Through what we call our primary among trees, which is our, our, our intestinal tract, our kidney, our lungs, our skin, and the one that most people aren't familiar with is our brain. Our brain is, a. unfortunately, we now know so much about how our emotions affect our physical aspect. And we say there's this gut-brain reaction that's very common uh, in, in language nowadays. So we live the so-called the ways that these organs do are the natural cleansing. Instead of putting you know, uh, our cells in a dishwasher, we basically keep supporting these five among trees. And the more that you support those, uh, the better it is that the body cleanses itself. And when you cleanse itself every day, a million cells is a drop in the bucket for the 37 trillion cells that we have. So there's no, there needs to be no worry or fear or any of that type of thing. And it doesn't mean you, you have to be a, you know, a purist and you can't have a pizza once in a while or have an ice cream cone once in a while. I mean, that's not what this is about. This is about an everyday type thing that and you know, why do people smoke for 20 or 30 or 40 years before you have a lesion large enough to say, oh, this person has lung cancer because the body has done a wonderful job, but it just got to a point where it got so overwhelmed that it couldn't keep up with it anymore. So if we do it on an everyday basis, that's why I'm not really a fan of so-called springtime detox. You know, you don't do a one or two week detox in the spring thinking that I'm going to get rid of uh, three or four months of debauchery because it's called Thanksgiving and Christmas and, 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 you know, and not moving your body as much because the weather is too cold, et cetera. So it, this is, it's an everyday thing. We just do it every day, becomes part of our everyday life. 
million cells is nothing drop in the bucket and you know you live to 100 and never had these cells develop to any anything of consequence wonderful all right so thank you for that i appreciate it truly um in terms of you, you, know, you talked a little bit about screening and you talked about again trying to be proactive can you say a bit about how biomed diagnostics might be helpful in spotting precancerous conditions or conditions in the body that would not um, be optimal in these circumstances? Sure. One of the things about you know imaging, whether it's a CRT or MRI or a blood test, <clears throat> is, is once again, those are in the moment, that's what's been happening, and it doesn't really show you where it's come from. The advantage of doing energetic type diagnostics that we do whether it's a contact regulation uh, thermometry <clears throat> or whether it's a heart rate variability, we can actually get a hint of what's been happening and how the body responds on an everyday basis to everyday stressors that they're, they're typically exposed to. And when we use that type of information, we're able to discern usually long before it gets to a point where you have detectable amounts of tissues or cells or a change on a blood test um, which is how really what prevention is. And when you see those changes uh, about to happen, we can actually start an intervention with some form of therapy, uh, whatever is appropriate to that individual. So we use the, the, the diagnostics much beyond, yes, we do use blood tests and yes, we do use MRIs and CTs like everyone else. However, we go beyond that. And we even go beyond functional medicine because functional medicine, which many people see a functional medicine doctor, they do a bunch of tests, but they're still waiting for something to be out of balance, but they're not asking, but why did it get there? Why is it like that? So uh, biological medicine, I would say, even goes a step farther. It looks farther beyond. And in addition to that, you know, part of our approach is to really try and understand these adverse childhood experiences that people have to try and explore the traumas that people had because it's now known that people have had four or more traumas at some point in their life have significantly higher risk of many of the chronic diseases that we now experience in our life uh, in general. And over 60% of people in research have demonstrated a minimum of one traumatic events and what one person perceives traumatic may not be what somebody else perceives, but it's in the eyes of the beholder. And since these are happening in childhood, and often the eye of the beholder is, you know, could be going back to the Romanian orphans back in the 1990s where they were left alone. And, and they, as they've grown up, they see all their health problems that developed from the fact that they never had any type of human touch. So we have so many positive ways of, of intervening before uh, the diagnosis. And as I said, the best way of treating it is not to get it. And that's why having a knowledge uh, before the fact and making those changes and, in, and including those uh, in your everyday lifestyle uh, that becomes an essential component of just health. And it's not just about cancer, it's about any disease. It's about having quality of life. It's about living your life to the fullest. Uh, I prefer to call it optimal performance. And whether I'm treating a, you know, a six-year-old autistic child or a Down syndrome child or somebody with cystic fibrosis or you know, somebody who has any other diagnosis or it's a you know a four-year-old leukemia patient or it's a 74-year-old leukemia patient uh, we have the therapies we have the advantage of basically making these interventions uh, to be incredibly effective and helpful for people on as i said cancer is something that affects uh, everybody in the world nobody is really immune wonderful and uh, elaine i love your question so dr tom a nice uh, nice one here wine helpful or harmful <laughs> Well, wine is in the Bible. So, uh, and as a Christian, uh, I believe that uh, Christ knew what he was doing. And so it's always a question of quantity. So, you know, if you look at the health paradox of France where they have less uh, heart disease, supposedly because they drink wine, the issue isn't about wine. So it's now recommended. Uh, and I believe that just changed. It's women, I believe it's, it's one glass of wine and I, and I I, I, since I don't drink alcohol myself, I don't, I'm not up on it, but I think maybe two for men and one for women. However, that's assuming that you're doing everything else. You're also walking, you're also getting enough sleep, you're also drinking enough water, you're also drinking multiple colors of foods, you're also moving your lymphatic system, etc. 
So one glass of wine for somebody who doesn't have good liver function will make them intoxicated, which puts more strain on their liver. So it's, it's unfair to say uh, one glass is okay and two is not okay. Uh, if everything is equal and everything was working well, one glass would not be a problem. Yeah, lest I need you to remind you of uh, Cain and Abel there, I'm not sure the Bible is our best source of current medical knowledge, but <laughs> I, I do trust that you're up on your literature and uh, <laughs> other literature, and uh, we'll run with that. Uh, <laughs> um, I did want to talk briefly, you, you were talking about the correlation between trauma and uh, ad adverse experiences, particularly in young people. I know this is something you're writing a book about. Can you perhaps talk a bit more about what, you're, what you have found in your research and through your writing experience that you might offer here? So in the course of, of treating patients who have chronic illness, you know, I've always sort of like a, a, you know, a dog with a bone, just so won't let it go until I sort of have uncovered what I believe is the true source of, you know, why do you get this? You know, why can we expose uh, 10 people to the same carcinogen, let's say, but they don't all develop cancer or they don't all get heart disease or whatever. Like there's something different. What, what is different about that individual that, 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 their body, unfortunately, went down that particular path. And what I found is, is that in the exploration of really a, a deep dive into their past history, because when I ask people about their childhood, I don't ask everybody about it, you know, seven out of eight people say it was fine, it was happy, et cetera. But when you really explore it, you actually say, well, it wasn't, we moved four times, I lost my friends, I lost this, I lost that. And then you start to appreciate the effect that that had in the development because our, our bodies literally only fully mature, more or less, women about age 25, men about age 28, which means between time, moment of conception until 28, there's this constant evolution. And even though we're born with all our body parts, they are not energetically mature. Our nervous system is the last to mature, which is the mid 20s. So literally something happening that can affect the nervous system anywhere between that conception and 28 potentially has the, has the ability to ultimately, which is why cancer shows up at age 50, because it's taken that long for the body to not be able to get ahead of what's, what's going on. So what I found is by developing a specific protocol that I call the brain protocol, we actually are able to reprogram the, the entire development of the nervous system, the endocrine system of the, and the organs to literally bypass that specific trauma. And what the book is about, it will be about <clears throat> uh, identifying some of these traumas, but identifying the different things that happen at different stages of our life and why people end up having in the hundreds of people that I put through this specific protocol, that usually there's a, this aha moment at the end and say, I get it. I understand now why I get migraine headaches. And it wasn't because I drank wine or aged cheese or it's hormones. Those are triggers, but they're not the cause. The real cause happened many, many years earlier, uh, often in an early developmental stage. And as we, as we support the, 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 those organs with energetic therapies, we're able to reprogram and then one day they say, wow, I don't have those migraine headaches anymore. I wonder, but I can still drink the glass of wine or eat HCs. So that's really what the, the goal is, is to go truly to what I call the root cause, not just what is the trigger. You can avoid the trigger and not get it, but what happens if you have the trigger, then you get a migraine again? That's what we're trying to address. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. All right, I'm just keeping an eye on time. We're down to our last minutes. Um, and so I'm gonna ask my colleague, Chris, who's on the call. Chris, if you could post. So next month's file bite on May 3rd, we'll welcome um, Chris Wills DeMello, who is an herbalist. Chris, you're the bomb. Someone got it. Um, uh, she's gonna be speaking about medicinal herb gardening um, and talking about just in time for the spring plants you can um, put in your garden. Uh, and, and how you might use those um, for positive effect on the body. Um, additionally, it, I'd be remiss not to mention, or yes, remiss not to mention, I should have just chosen different words, um, that Dr. Tom is lead instructor of a course we just launched over this past year, um, Biomed for Practitioners, our fundamental course, or his, his foundational course rather, 
is open to anyone who's interested. Information is available on our website. And of course, you can always reach out to me here at the Marion Institute if you wish. Um, that course is being offered fully online. Um, you can begin at any time. Uh, and there's a $200 cost for that. For those who might be naturopaths or working in that field, there are continuing medical education credits available. Um, so again, if you're interested in learning more about course offerings, um, current and future, please do reach out. And then there was a lastly question, Dr. Tom, your book, when might that be out? Uh, the hope is, is that my, I'm going to go for June 1st, but you know how publishing goes. So it'll be by the summer at the latest. It's the proofreader actually has it right now. I just corresponded yesterday. We're sort of in this final stages of trying to get it uh, ready to go to the publication. So it's sooner than later. Let's put it that way. Wonderful. And then I did have a question sneak in there. So before we wrap, I just want to honor that this question's in our chat box. Um, are there best forms of vitamin C for uh, someone who has a breast cancer diagnosis um, when IV is not an option? Uh, basically, it's going to have to be for some form of buffered C because in order to get high enough doses, uh, vitamin C just taken straight, you know, is uh, without being buffered, meaning it has other minerals in it, will probably cause a lot of gastrointestinal irritation. So, you know, you're going to probably it's going to be a powder form that has minerals associated with it, which can buffer the acidity because ascorbic acid is obviously an acid. Great. And I would, um, Dr. Tom, is it fair to say that if someone wanted to follow up with that, uh, Jamie Dufresne at the Biomed Center who runs their medicinary might be a good point of contact? Absolutely. She's, yeah. she's a wealth of information at the Biomed Center. Great. And again, if there's a question about how to get in touch, um, please do feel free to reach out to me, kmanix at marioninstitute.org. All right, Dr. Tom, thank you again so much for your time today. As always, it's our pleasure to have had you. It's a pleasure to always be here. Thank you. Everyone enjoy your afternoon and thanks for joining.